thank you to the three of you um, legends in this uh, in this space in this movement for joining um, us today on this episode of Black Minds Matter. And a uh, brief introduction for, for each and every one of you, of course, we have uh, Chris Stewart, who is the CEO of Brightbeam, also a um, huge, huge mentor of mine, someone I look up to. I'm in this movement asking questions all the time, you know, just trying to trying to find my space and, and my place in this in this um, in this movement. And then of course, the illustrious Darrell Bradford, uh, movie connoisseur, Star Wars expert, lover. Yeah. lover of all films, <laughs> um, executive vice president of, of 50 Can, also um, someone that I look up to and, and admire um, very, very, very much. Um, and then last but not least, uh, Nanya Morris, a close friend of mine, um, currently a senior, right? Senior? Senior at Florida State University, uh, majoring in uh, chemical engineering. Um, and also a um, AFC Future Leaders Fellow. So um, him and I have had the honor of, of hanging out quite a bit and discussing school choice and, and definitely basketball. We had a trip in California where all the guys had a heated debate about about sports and basketball. So that was that was a ton of fun. Um, but yeah, let's jump right into it. I have I have a lot of questions, a lot of things that I want to cover and talk about. So. Uh, we'll just we'll just get started. Um, and the first the first thing I want to throw out um, is to Darrell. Um, in June, you wrote an op-ed, I think it was in the seventy four, about you know black lives and black families and you know this current state of of our country right now. And one thing I'm gonna quote something that that you said in that article. You said the revelation about public education is simply this. We can't have an all education matters approach to the challenges of black education. One that doesn't require states or districts to meet the needs of the kids who too are fighting to be free and equal, but instead demands that they conform to the systems that have not historically worked for them in the name of the public good. All education cannot matter until black education does. And and also in that article, you you know you talk about your own life experiences um, and and the school choice that that you were fortunate enough to receive. So so let's talk a little bit about that. You know what does it look like, uh, you know, being a black student? Um, we're going to get to Nani on that one, of course, too. But a black student in a environment where like school choice wasn't as prominent as it is now. Yeah. So uh, Walter, thanks you for having uh, for having me. Uh, I'm a great admirer of yours, and it was a pleasure to meet Nanya last fall. And obviously, uh, Chris is my road dog. At least I'm going to say that publicly. If, if I'm not, he'll tell me privately. Uh, but it's a pleasure <laughs> to see him uh, too. Um, so, uh, so when I was writing that piece, it took me like a long time to to write it. And the one thing that I kept coming back to is that at the center this relationship between like the between the police and you know chris is from uh minnesota so he he's right up in it too um you know the center of the this relationship between the police and and black people like that that relationship is just is very different than the police and all other people because of the history of black people in in the american experiment right and and i'm a person who is aspirational about the American experiment. Like there, there's sort of two ways to think about America. It's either like irredeemable or it is constantly trying to live up to its highest and best ideals and that that process is painful. And, and I really try to uh, uh, ascribe to the latter. Um, but uh, in thinking about that, I was just like, you know, black people, the only people in the history of this country that have had laws, like like legit laws on the books everywhere that have prohibited not only our right to learn, but that have sort of um, circumscribed where we could learn even, right? <laughs> right? Like, you know, they, you, you won't go places, you will go where you're told. And, and that, that, that happened after, you know, the opening salvo was that you will not learn at all, right? Which is obviously the legacy of, of slavery. And you can't um, address that without understanding that all of the systems we put together for how we deliver school, in particular, redlining of housing and residential assignment that lives in that red, red that uh, in the, the legacy of redlining, um, are are specifically targeted at us, 
right? I mean, they, right, they yeah. had the most pernicious impact on us, and right. So, so as long as you're willing to keep that, which is essentially like the least choicey thing possible, right? You get your school and your house in place, then you're never going to have a solution that works for us, right? It, it might, you know, you you might luck into it, but that's the all education matters solution. Um, and if you're us, and like, and then I'll stop, you know, like. Like the black experience with education is normally like three of the four ways you you go to school, right? You're lucky, like me. You're rich, which I wasn't, right? Which so you, you know you're lucky. You get into the right school. You're rich. You buy the right one. It's more like you're connected, right? You know somebody who gets you to hook up, you know, or you lie. You tell people you live someplace that you don't live, you know, and and that's how that's how black people black folks navigate. School choice, like that's how we work through the the experiment, and we do that because we're in a system that doesn't prioritize us, you know, and that has been set up to make sure that we don't have the same kinds of optionality that other people uh, have. And I just think that's that's fundamental. And if you're not going to stick at that, then you're not serious about doing what's good and what's right for for black people. So right, right, yeah, and I and I think I think that's also a very important thing to to talk about because I mean I've had firsthand experience in Nebraska where we were there testifying at a hearing and we're talking about hey you know families black families in particular here in Nebraska don't have a lot of options they they want school choice and then one of the one of the senators there schools in Nebraska yeah right yeah and then and then one of the one of the senators there um, you know, was was implying that you know none of us would have been there unless we were being paid, or you know, all of these extra kind of things coming at us. But then that was so that was in February. But then you know, when all this stuff happened, sure enough, I come across one of his tweets, and he's like, "Black Lives Matter," and I'm just like, "You obviously don't see the disconnect here. Like we're we're begging and, and pleading for these black children to have these experiences and to be able to really." Uh, you know, have the education that they deserve, a high quality education. But then, you know, when it's time for you to write a, write a hashtag or write something that's trending, you know, you want you want to hop on. And so, yeah, um, just just a, just a quick pivot on this, and 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 again, then I'll stop. Like the physical violence has like a heat and an immediacy to it, right? Mm -hmm, that yeah. the slow cooling of your potential in a school that doesn't work for you doesn't. And so it's a lot easier to ignore the fact that like we're going to schools that make sure that we that you know we never fully live in a lot of a lot of right. cases, yeah. and that is equally horrible. Yeah, that's that's a really excellent point. So so moving on, uh, kind of piggyback off the off of that, Nanya, um, tell us a little bit about your your experience, your educational journey, and how that you know shaped you whether it was in the public school or, or when you when you left um ultimately to you know what you're doing right now well um i would say so growing up um i would say as far back as elementary school uh i went to a predominantly uh white elementary school i lived in a neighborhood to where I, it was only a few i would say um minorities i would say yeah, only a few um, so I was the only like uh, minority in my class or a black person in my class. Um, so I kind of had a rough time just with that, dealing with that, you know, that and just moving to Florida. And then um, as, as the year progressed, uh, they noticed that I was lacking in, um, you know, reading, writing, uh, and things, things along that sort. Um, so they decided to um, decide to try to send me to like a Spanish speaking school to try to get me to help with English and stuff like that. And my parents said, wait, hold on. Like he had no problem understanding, you know, English. He just had problems with, you know, understanding the actual grammar and how to construct, you know, sentences on paper. Um, they still pushed along those lines. Um, and luckily my parents were able to uh, find a, uh, a private school um, that was funded based on scholarships. Uh, given by donors and things like that um that would actually uh, take me in and you know uh you know allow me to advance in my academic career uh, along those lines um and and it was a little strange because uh with that school it was based off of a, a test taking um it was based off testing to get in and mm -hmm. only had about 10 spots per class so i was one of the lucky few that was able to you know get in and events uh, that way and um with that school actually it's called academy prep is in um they they what they receive is called the um 
the step for student scholarship is one of the uh, scholarships that uh, we talk about normally. But um, so that school actually monitors monitors you and um, it actually tracks you throughout college. So it actually provides funding if you need it and um, helps you along the way. And I would say that's one of the biggest um, that's one of the biggest institutions. Just one of the biggest things that I would say helped me um, get to where I am today. Uh, they they allowed me to get into the high school that I wanted to get into. Um, they allowed, they pushed me to go to uh, the college I wanted to go to before the state. And they still keep in contact with you um, throughout college. So it's just, um, I'm, I was blessed to get a lot of those resources, but I grew up with a lot of friends who didn't get a lot of those resources and um, basically were still, are basically stagnant in where they are today. Either they're at home, you know, basically with their parents, you know, or they're in the trouble with, you know, law or just other things. Hmm. They didn't have as many avenues as I had. And um, yeah. I would say based off of, it shouldn't be based off of just, you know, those 10 spots. So if you get into those 10 spots, you know, you're good. But everyone else who doesn't fit into those 10 spots, you know, they they get, you know, the short end of the stick and they have to go the traditional route. Yeah. And and I think something that's that's really interesting about that is, with you know kind of your your journey like you didn't even when you got to college i mean chemical engineering i mean it wasn't like you went to college and studied you know like communications or like me like i went yeah i went i went for journalism you know like you know something you know relatively you know light but i mean chemical engineering is it's something that's you know like a very very impressive impressive feat and now currently i know you're in uh wisconsin for a um, a GE internship, right? Like, tell tell us a little bit about that. Some of the really cool things that you're doing mm -hmm. there. So currently, I'm in. Oh, well, first I would speak uh, um on the fact of uh, what you say a little earlier. Just um, as you said, being being like going to college in chemical engineering, and the fact that um, when I was younger, you know, I had they said oh like all these problems with uh, especially like oh you couldn't learn and stuff like that. I would say majority of the children I see today and even like the friends I had back then had the mental capacity to do what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. um, it's just uh, not having the resources um, yeah. or, you know, people to look at, look, look out for them along the way. Um, so that's one of the big things that I would, would like to say. But um, going along the lines of what I'm doing here at, at GE, um, currently I'm working um, as a For the summer um for my summer internship so what i'm actually doing is i'm working on like the ct uh legacy production line so they're making different cts that go into uh the different hospitals that need them especially during uh covid uh, 19 um the, the pandemic um so basically mm -hmm. I, what i'm doing I'm, I'm building uh gauges uh go no go gauges for the ct production line um just to help expedite the process and to help um, ensure the quality um, stays the same, especially as they ramp up production, um, given like the pandemic. So that's awesome. It, it's it's yeah. a lot going on, but um, yeah, it's it's a uh, it's worth it. It's worth it. And you see, you see the, the um, help, and you you see the uh, you, you you can actually see the impact that's going on with, with with the work you're doing here. Yeah, that's 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 really 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 incredible. Uh, now, Chris, I'm moving on to you, and this is like. I think it's going to be a great discussion, but it's a it's a question that I've had um, for quite a while. I've really been thinking through this, and um, when I left public school, I was attending. I went to similar to Nanya, similar to Darrell. I went to a private school that was majority white, mostly white. You know, there was only you know maybe you know a handful of of, of black minority. Um, students in my class, let alone, you know, the entire school. And so what are some of the challenges that, that, that you've seen or that or that you have experienced that is a huge block being in that environment as a young African-American student? And when you say being in that environment, you mean being like in the um, very white private school environment? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, you all have experienced it firsthand, but I'll say this much, like, like you guys would be the experts on that one. But I think your question points out a problem that we have, which is um, we would have a more burgeoning black private school market 
if the funds were there, if the market was created. So right now what we have are people that are uh, working intently to make sure that that never becomes a market and that that market never forms. And the quickest way to do that is to make sure that you trap all of the kids who would be in that market in the traditional district schools, which I call pension farms, and make sure that they stay in those pension farms and don't get right. released in anywhere. And then make sure that you um, that you fund enough of their politicians and their so-called leaders and their so-called um, uh, nonprofits to keep the policy uh, as such that you can't ever create choice and opportunity for kids to get out of the regular system. So what we have is we have a lot of these kind of um, black private school exceptionalism stories, right? Like the chosen few, the ones who got out, uh, the ones who made it, the ones who got out the bucket, the crabs, <laughs> the rest of the crabs were fighting to make it, <laughs> but these are the ones that got out, you know? Right. And uh, it's almost like y'all escaped, runaway slaves, you know? It's like the ones who made it up north. And you know, <laughs> meanwhile, everybody else is still sharecropping and still on the plantation, y'all up in Chicago, like listening to good jazz and having good music and everything. <laughs> um, and the, the problem with it for me is, well, first of all, you guys are a good example of what is not a problem. What is not a problem is when you come, when you understand how special your story was and how much of an opportunity it was for you, and you come back and fight for that opportunity for other people to have it. That's what's going right with it. What's going wrong with it is when people like you all uh, go into leadership positions and then start shutting the door on other people by saying, we just need to double down on regular traditional public school. You know, school choice is yeah. bad. Yeah. It was good for yeah. me, but it was bad, yeah. you know, yeah. um, for everybody else. So uh, and then there's this thing, too, I think that you all would be able to speak on differently. The reason I bring up a black private school market is I think that black families are having to make a trade off sometimes between academics and culture. Um, and I think what a lot of middle class, especially families would black families would really appreciate to not have to make that trade off yeah. to, to have opportunity to have excellence and black culture be one place, be in yeah. one building and in one thing. Um, because there's a great concern about ec uh, our, our, um, uh, ethnic stripping, you know, ethnic uh, um, a reduction in your like, you, you send a kid off uh, to one of these institutions, they come back very smart and book smart and have learned a lot of things and they don't always uh, come back ready to interact with their own people, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, that I, I live that. I think we talked about it a little bit on, on your show, you know, how um, a lot of things culturally I was not, I was not taught, I was not aware of until, you know, I moved to DC and I started to really, you know, do the research on on my own and, and my family, it was just, you know, they just wanted me to get a good education so I could get out of my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. and, and like you said, I think that's something that family shouldn't have to have to sacrifice. Like I use the term whitewashing. I think that's a little harsh and a little, you know, a little drastic, but like that's, the only you know way I can really you know really you know explain it you know all my friends um, were you know middle class upper middle class had pools in their backyards you know you know Teslas and, and Ranger you know all these things and so when I would go when I would go over their houses right it was a completely different environment than I was used to right like mm. gated neighborhoods multiple you know video games like you know they always talk about you know the stainless steel refrigerator door you know things like that or or a uh, refrigerator in the garage, right? Like two refrigerators, you know, that's like, it's unheard of where I come from. And so um, being able to get that education, but then also, you know, not losing who I am, you know, as a black man, I think is also something that is, is super important. And so kind of switching gears, but still on that topic, Darrell, um, you talk about as, as well as Chris a lot about um, you know, black representation and leadership within, you know, the, the, the reform movement, whether that's like, you know, having donors be more aggressive towards, um, you know, funding toward, you know, these, these local mom and pop, you know, charter schools to, to kind of battle that, that, that issue. So what are some of the, the tangible things that, that we could be doing now to, to have those conversations and, and to, to really bring up those issues? Yeah, uh, so so what a great question. Um, and the other thing I just want to say too is that like, like let's get the 
the, the dyad isn't quite that you get to go to this great school that's filled with white people and you don't learn much about yourself versus you got to go to this terrible school that was filled with people like you and suddenly you were made whole, right? So so the 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 challenge of and and I wasn't always in this place in my career and I think you know Chris illuminates it really well. Like you go on different paths and like you're around different people and you have different jobs and like one day you're this guy, the next day you're that guy, you know, and like, and the world is very different. And I, uh, I think in a lot of respects, I've been fortunate enough to go through that. It's given me some perspective on this question of like who we are and like who we are as people and what that means for everything, you know? But the, one of the challenges I think, you know, let, let's call everybody on this, uh, in, in this discussion, um, an education entrepreneur, right? Like we're, like we're all uh, aligned around things that I at least think, and I think everybody else thinks here, are good and right and true that are ultimately gonna make people um, freer and uh, uh, increase the opportunity for them to become the best version of themselves, right? So that's, the, that's what we're doing, you know? Um, entrepreneurs of color, right, su suffer from some barriers, right, that that uh, that that just to be flipped, like white folks don't really suffer from. <laughs> so there's a great piece, uh, maybe it's in the Financial Times a couple of weeks ago, about how in Silicon Valley, if you're a black, you know, tech exec, mm -hmm. when you go to the meeting, you take you take your white boy with you, right? Mm -hmm. He's your boy, he's white. Like your friends, he's maybe he's your chief operating officer. You're the founder, right? And all the people they interview would say, we go into the meeting. The other, the, the the VC guy comes over. He shakes my guy's hand, and it's like, no, no, no you just shake my hand, right? Like, he, right, yeah. So, like, I'm, I'm just sort of highlighting that to say that there are these um, barriers for, for good or ill. Like, some of it is just like people networks are self reinforcing, right? Like, like rich white people know rich white people, you know, whatever that kind of stuff that um, that present themselves across all sectors of entrepreneurship. You could be in the private sector. You could be trying to start a new school. You could be trying to build a fellowship, right? Like that, that's sort of there. Um, and my sort of commentary on that is that um, there, are two, there are two ways to get funders in particular, if you work in the nonprofit world, right? To, to think about this. One is to shame them on um, on the legacy of their uh, ineptitude, right? And just be like, you you know, you, you're the bad guy, right? Like you got all the green, but you're not giving it to any black people, right? Um, another is to, help them understand that it is in their self-interest. It is in the interest of the thing that they care about to have a more diverse pe group of people working on it. Just like all political coalition, like a diverse political coalition tends to be a better one, you know, whatever. And so for the charter school example, right? It's a great example. Like, you know, where's that idea? Hatched in Minnesota, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Cap captures the imagination of a bunch of very highly educated people in uh, in elite northeastern schools for the most part, right? Who were road scholars and whatever, like many of them white, who knew funders, many of them white, and they got together and they spun up the like what we now know as the sort of like proto charter school movement, you know. And in doing that, they squeezed out lots of people who just wanted to start one school, right, in their neighborhood to solve their problem for kids that look like that. Um, and that is, it is not in your interest if you like charter schools, right? For instance, to do that, just like to Chris's point, mm -hmm. it's not in your instance if you care about schools that affirm black identity to let all the private schools do it already close, right? Because <laughs> they're awesome. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In New York, you know, that, that, the Piney Wood School in, uh, in, in um, Mississippi, you know, that kind of thing. So, so I, I just, you know, like, uh, because you can overcome this, right? You have a responsibility to overcome it. And it's, I don't want to say it's riskier, but it is different, right? And it is grounded in having like more versions of success than we are normally used to. And that's a good thing. And, and again, like I just talk about charter schools sometimes because they're such a good grab bag for so many of the, the policies that we sort of work on. <laughs> You know, as as like a uh, as a movement, you know, people who care about kids of color, um, but it doesn't really it, it doesn't just stop there. Yeah. Anything you want to add to that, Chris? Um, you know, if we, when you're talking about the philanthropic part of this movement, we there's an elephant in the room that we never really mention. So I don't know if y'all want me to mention it right now. Oh, come on, break it down, break it down for us. Um, 
I was just looking for this, uh, this quote, you know, like, uh, if, if black America were a country, it would be, it would have a bigger GDP per capita than Russia, Mexico, Brazil, China, Iraq, Cuba, India. Um, I saw that on yeah. and on and on and on down the line. Right. If you think about that, black Americans are not poor. Actually, black, black Americans are relatively wealthy by world standards and, uh, our economy is in the trillions, right? Um, and there's only uh, 8 million of our kids in public schools. So the idea that a country the size of Mexico, a GDP the size of Mexico can't educate 8 million kids is our first problem. The idea that we have to beg white people for money in the first place to fund our own freedom. Howard Fuller says this is one of our core problems is that we're having to ask white people to fund our liberation. Right. And what we don't do, what we do oftentimes is a lot of complaining and criticizing about the people who are funding us. <laughs> right. Without yeah. ever turning the lens on the people who are not funding us right. who should be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Black people have this thing called the Urban League, the UNCF, Jack and Jill fraternities and sororities, all of Greek life, Black Chamber of Commerce, and just go on and on and on and on. And the collective budgets and infrastructure and manpower of those people right now. The idea that we would have all of that and we would be begging a Bloomberg or a Walton or anybody else or I'm trying to shame a Kellogg or a Ford or whatever right. into right. funding our some schools right now. Do you do you think that it would be impossible for us to have a black funded and run tutoring program nationally right now during COVID? No. Is there any reason we should be no. writing grants? No. Is there any reason that we should have to write grants right now to, mm -hmm. to Kellogg Foundation and say, in the interest of racial equity, <laughs> could you please give us something that we're not giving ourselves, that we can right. possibly right. fund for ourselves? So yeah. it's not a popular point to make. Mm -hmm. It really is not a popular point to make, but I think our biggest frustration is that we're not acknowledging the fact that we shouldn't even have to be begging for money outside of ourselves until we run out of our own first. Yeah. Um, Can I say one thing on that, Chris? Go ahead. We like appreciate you doing the pachyderm talk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but in truth, that conversation happens when we're not in the room. Uh, and, and like, you know, like I have good relationships with a lot of white people with money. And a lot of time they're like, why is it this black billionaire funding this? That's right. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, like, why don't you ask it? You know, but it, it's it's a it is it's a genuine concern, and uh, and people ask about it. I mean, listen, you look up. I'll tell you two quick different stories within seconds. Le LeBron James puts some money into a school, starts a thing, blah blah blah. Right? I have a a friend who's in another city who is very close with a very well fund, uh, well incomed um, black NBA player. <laughs> uh, and he tried to bring the same thing to him. And the response was, yeah, man, I'm not into that sort of thing. Now you're talking about somebody with millions upon millions upon millions upon millions. And the ask was only for like about five, 10 million. And it wasn't asked of the one person. It was, can you just, you know, get some of your homies yeah. in yeah. any city, in any city with a good basketball team, you probably have five people that could actually uh, get us a, a school or a tutoring program going. Um, but we're just not into that sort of thing. King LeBron is into that sort of thing. Now, King LeBron has more money than baseball, but <laughs> um, um, so he could do this sort of thing. My only point in saying all that is that's not to say that we shouldn't still be holding white philanthropy accountable if they want to do things in our communities. We should, but we should also be looking for self-funding ways. And then, incidentally, it's not just about money either. When it comes to who we're going to organize and whatnot, why are we standing alone? Why are you going to Nebraska, sitting in a room and having people tell you that the only reason that you're there is because you're being paid, right? Right. Right. They need to be looking at 50 to 100 other black people saying the same thing. And that's another one of our core issues. Why aren't our people with us a lot of times on the yeah. things that we're on? Yeah. yeah. Where are our people? Yeah. If black and minds so, matter, where are people? Right, that, right. That's my question. Yeah. Black minds really matter. Where yeah. are y'all? And so, and so we have that connection, right? Four of us, people in our movement have made that connection between, you know, the importance of Black Lives Matter and Black Minds Matter mm -hmm. as well. And a lot of people, whether they they refuse to to make that connection or they just don't know or they're they're ignorant to it. How how do we help others understand? You know, like like Darrell says in in his article, you know, black black lives don't 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 matter until you know black education matters. And so I I feel like 
in this space, in the work that I do and the work that we do, it's like we have highs and lows, but then when you look at it, it's like, it's progress really being made as far as people understanding that, you know, the way out for a lot of black people is through education. And so how do we, like you said, come together with our own communities to to make those kind of things happen. So I guess I guess the question is like what what are things that that you know AFC can do, 50 can can do, uh, you know, Bright Beam, Ed Potion, all of these, all of these reform groups or advocacy groups, what can we do now to to help further push that that context? Chris, you want to go first? Um <laughs> <laughs> we can do so many things, but it's all going to require money. So right, what I just said right. a minute ago, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just uh, let's backtrack on a little bit of that. Yeah, it's all going to require resources or whatnot. But listen, I think honestly, what the piece that you're talking about that Darrell wrote is like one of the ways there is whatnot. We have to be communicators. We have to communi communicate the ideas. We have to be thought leaders. We can't be a people that um, just reacts to everything and waits for, for things to happen. Right now you have people that are generating like pods and, and educational collaboratives or whatnot. And you know, I'm left with the idea of where's our space that we're creating? Where's our platform that we're creating where we have that type of ideation going on? not just following the leader or writing the grant or writing the grant report, but where's our center of ideation? And uh, one of the things I think we all could be doing a better job of is I mentioned all of those organizations that we have in our own networks and our, our communities that have infrastructure and have staff, but don't always have an ideation around education policy. They don't, uh, matter of fact, oftentimes they farm that out or they have one or two people on staff who are overworked who are trying to do that. And when you come to them and say, hey, let's do a joint report together, let's do some work together around what's possible for the marginalized and for people who aren't usually heard, they're kind of like, well, great, you know, let's do that. I don't think we do enough of infrastructure sharing. Uh, and also, let me just call another thing in our, uh, uh, and, and Darrell, you might be able to take this further with, um, with something profound to say, but I'll just say this much, it gets a little parochial in um in education nonprofit mm -hmm. everybody wants to be the one who owns the yeah. report on the thing or right. oh no how are you going to organize parents i'm organizing parents you know or oh no why, why are you doing an advocacy thing we're doing an advocacy thing you know and and a little bit of that parochial nonsense is is not helpful uh, uh, we actually need to be collaborating more yeah so two uh two quick things on that um your parochial comment is really well taken because though the like the forces of the status quo make it seem like there are billions of us. There's like ten of us. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, right, it's right. like the Avengers. Yeah, yeah. Like the Avengers. Yeah, the populism is not helpful because it's like you know one of us goes down. Like it's a significant right. loss. You know, that's so right. that's the one thing. The other thing I would say, and then actually, I'm, I'm, I would I would kind of reverse this question and put it to you guys since you since mm -hmm. we're ostensibly old heads. I'd love to know what you'd like for us to do. Um, but the one of the things I struggle most with most with is telling people that it's okay to have expertise in the thing that you have expertise in, even while all kinds of other things are going on. So like if you think about the unrest of the summer, right? And with which, you know is the, the, the sort of, um, you know, grows out of the tension of COVID and how COVID is affecting communities of color harder, you know, like hitting us harder than other people, right? Um, after the killing of George Floyd, lots of people were like, well, is education even important? They're like, how, you know, what does it matter if my kid can read if, I, they have to worry about, you know, their safety when they go when they go outside. And I'm like, yeah. that's absolutely why it matters. <laughs> right? Because right, right. in the end, like no, no person who is not well educated is going to get justice for George Floyd or any other person who is the victim of this device that we all live in. Right. And I don't take that position because I don't think food, shelter, Wealth, wealth, wealth appreciation, all, all the like personal safety, personal liberty, right? Like, it's not like I don't think those things matter, but I'm, I've spent a very long time working to try to be good at this one thing. And that is my unique contribution. And I feel like a lot of people who work in our space, right, 
confronted by the this um, this this the the juggling of all of these very important things right now have have lost the plot some. And so it's not, it, it is deeply important now more than ever, like the more tumultuous the time, you know, the more important it is that you, that you stay focused on the place where you add the highest value. Right. And, mm -hmm. and I like for me that, you know, that's education and like, I'm, that's going to be my story. That's I'm sticking to it. That's been 50 can story. You know, we're, we're sticking to it because that's what our lane is. And, and, uh, and it's hard to do that right now because lots of folks are like, we need to do this other thing. And we're going to be, yeah. you know, we're going to do the thing we're good at because that's the thing we do. So, yeah, yeah. Um, Nanya, moving over to you. Um, one thing that we hear a lot of, a lot of in this movement is that you know people will say, oh, I'm for, I'm for you know education reform, but not you know when it comes to, to private schools or you know there's always there's always some kind of like you know. I'm in, but not not all the way, right? I, I got my toes like just in the water, but you know I'm not ready to you know jump in all the way. Um, how important, and and you can think on you know your own life experience, your sister who's also um, an ASC fellow. How important is it um, for families, all families, to have as many options as possible versus saying you have school choice, but only with these two options or these are your own, you have school choice, but these are your only two choices. How important do you think that is to, to have that much um, choice and that much dynamic within a family? Um, personally, I feel that it's uh, extremely important um, just because, uh, yeah, you might have one school, let's say it's a private school, it has many resources um, and everyone says, well, look, that's a good private school, you know, why don't you just go to that one? Um, but it doesn't fit your child's needs. Um, it might be good in, you know, math and sciences. You know, the, the grammar and stuff like that. Or it might be good in, yes, let's say the opposite. And, you know, you want to pick and choose, you know, what's best for your child and what your child actually needs. So the school, like me personally, the school that I, I went to, it was good in a lot of, it had a lot of different extracurricular activities and stuff like that. But I, I couldn't learn it. There was other things that it had that I just, I just, you know, couldn't concentrate in classes. I didn't feel comfortable because, you know, even though I was, you know, young, I still noticed that there was no one in the class that looked like me and, and things along those lines. So um, I feel just having that option um, uh, just allowed you to grow as an individual. Um, and um, I, I wanted to speak on a, another point um, earlier uh just um on the fact of you know i would say black people helping other black people uh um i would say i was one of my mentors brought this idea up to me and i've never really thought about it before um he said that once you get in a position uh of power or something like that um and you feel that you deserve that position you're more likely to help you know someone um, coming you know, up the ladder, uh, uh, like if you if you get in a position and you feel that you don't deserve that position or you feel that your diversity higher, even though you do deserve it, yeah, you're more likely to yeah. not help anybody you know mm -hmm. coming along the line because you don't want to lose what you have. You, you know you don't want to get taken away. You know stuff like that. So I just feel like that was a a good point that I never thought of, and I and I feel that personally because a lot of the time, you know, being like you're the only you know person of color in this position, stuff like that. You feel that, you know, hey, I'm the only person. I want to stay here. I, don't, I want to be comfortable, you know. You don't want to, you know, tip the line, you know, tiptoe the line at all. But um, if you feel you deserve it, yeah, you should get out there, you know, help it, help, you know, do what you can, you know, to allow for more people that look like you to get where you are. Yeah, yeah, that's that's super important. I, re I remember when, um, when I went to the White House event, um, you know, I, I try not to do this, but it's just human nature. It's natural. Like when I when I walk into a room, especially in, you know, the political atmosphere, right? It's, you know, usually, usually, you know, white people. So I, you know, do a general scan of the room. It's like, okay, is there anyone that, you know, is black or, you know, just, just, just anyone. And, and I walk into the room and uh, this black guy came up to me and like immediately, like I just felt way more comfortable, right? Like came up, introduced himself, 
dap me up, wasn't even a hand, like a handshake, dap me up and was like, you know, what's going on, brother? You know, you know, all, all this stuff we were talking about, you know, sports and suits and, and, and all that. But I think, you know, that is, that's so important. And, you know, should it be that way? You know, you can, you can have your opinion, but I think something that's very, very important to have is that, you know, representation in those environments, because I've traveled, traveled the country and, and been in, you know, schools where these black students have black teachers mm -hmm. and just watching how they interact with each other. I was like, man, you know, I loved my private school, but I didn't have a single black teacher. The only, there were two black people on staff. One was the janitor and the other was the athletic director at the time. Mm -hmm. And so, and so I had, I had a black coach for, for track. Um, but then it's just like, that's like, I, I've missed out huge. If I can go back in time and, you know, go back to school, right? Like I'd want a black teacher. And um, I think that's something that, that is so important and something that not a lot of people outside of our community really understand. You, you know what, um, Walter? Just a quick point about that from an old man. Uh oh. You know, um, I've actually been in a lot of rooms and uh, I've scanned a lot of rooms. And never have I scanned, oh, there's a black dude, there's a white person, and there's the leader of the free world. I have not scanned. I, I mean, <laughs> I'm kind of old, too. I haven't had this experience of, you know, when I met with the president, you know, um, I, I, I joke, I jest. But you can't discount either the idea that we want our kids to get out oftentimes and we want them to develop social capital and to be able to read a room because rooms lead to other rooms and then rooms and rooms right. and rooms and rooms. And some yeah. of our people are only making it through the first room or the second room and the third room. And here I am talking to a, a brilliant, talented black man in the United States who made it to the room <laughs> and scanned it out and told the leader of the free world, I might have your job one day. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm all yeah. for school choice, bro. Right. <laughs> I'm like right. all right. for school choice. Yeah. I'm all for vouchers, whatever you want to call it, whatever we'll get. Because one of the rubs on which one of the weird ironies about leftists who are into integration, who are also against um, school choice. When they say, you know, integration makes you it gives you more social capital. It improves your network. You have lifelong gains from it because you meet people that you wouldn't have met who become your people at some point and you, you have access, except for, for private schools. We want you to right. integrate into these better networks just within the public system. Um, I, I actually wanted from my kids, I didn't have your guys' experience in life. I had a very different experience. I, I, was, at, I was the anti Darrell Bradford. See, Darrell grew up in Freddie Gray's neighborhood and Darrell got out and I'm the type that stayed around <laughs> and, and thought, wow, they didn't pick me. Like, you know, those machines in the in the arcades that pick the thing up. And mm -hmm. Yeah, the claw. Like, right. Yeah. yeah. The, claw. Yeah. Uh, the claw didn't come for me. The claw didn't come for me. So I, I stayed behind. But when I became a parent, what I wanted for my kids and as a young uh, father who knew that uh, my school didn't set me up to live the same life that the white people I was working for at the time that their kids and I was watching what their kids do. My kid graduate. My kid went from K all the way through college and left the country right after college and went and taught in two different countries and had more stamps in his uh, in his passport than I have ever uh, experienced or whatnot. And that's the story I wanted to tell about school choices. I was strategically trying to put him in places and in rooms that would make him comfortable in any of those situations that you all are comfortable in right now. So you, we can talk about what you may have lost or may not have had by not having the, the total hood experience. At the same time, what we need to be talking about is more people having your experience. Yeah. yeah. Being yeah. able to, to do in a room what you all can do right now. I want all my kids to experience that. And can I just, Chris, just one thing to go back to kind of the question before, and I think it's sort of like an interesting lead in. You know, there's like research about the role of and effectiveness of black teachers on all kids, not just black kids, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, and it is worth noting that, as Chris off, often does, mm -hmm. that one of the um, casualties of school integration were black teachers. Yes, <laughs> like, yeah. right. Yeah. So, yeah. So, like, so own that, own that. And then on the other side, it was like a couple of years ago, I wrote a piece 
um, there was a study where they looked at um, math teachers um, and, and, uh, uh, and how they perceived the ability of, mm -hmm. uh, of an African-American boy to, to, mm -hmm. to learn math. And the, the biggest gap between the talent in math and the perception of the talent in math was if the boy was black and the teacher was white. So, mm -hmm. like, I don't mm -hmm. ascribe that to, to all white teachers, but mm -hmm. I'm saying, like, you can't, I mean, this is what the other guys are defending. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. like yeah. So that's the system that they're like, yeah, we love this thing. Like, everybody should be in it. <laughs> and mm -hmm. we're like, yeah, maybe we want some more escape valves. You know, normally when black people put all of our eggs in one basket, it doesn't end well, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. But we allow them to malign the idea of it too, to make, if you're one of those parents, you should feel guilty. What about the kids you left behind? Right. Uh, don't you believe in public education? Don't you believe in the, the center cornerstone of democracy and all that? And then they make you, they, they saddle you with that. Like you're, you're a selfish person. You're a selfish American for wanting the best. Every generation has wanted better for their kids than they had. That is the American story, right? And yeah. definitely every generation of black people have hoped and dreamed and prayed for their next generation to do better than they did. So someone telling you, um, you should feel guilty um, for like, you're supposed to have, what do, what do they call it is like survivor's guilt or something like that, um, that you're supposed to have. Yeah. Um, um, but that works on our community. It yeah. really does work. It, it's a, it's a powerful narrative and it works. And it's because we're like a moral people, you know, but, mm -hmm. but, it, but it, mm -hmm. in works of this, I think is, is also true. And I've been dropping this on people all the time. If you ever make a law, that requires a parent not to work in the vicious and ruthless self-interest of their own kid, that's mm -hmm. a bad law. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because like, if, if, if you don't want what's better, like, like every parent wants what's better, that, that's like a fundamental assumption. More important, it's a human assumption. It's why we're actually here, right? Because like mm -hmm. every parent is ruthlessly self-interested in the success of their kid. And there is nothing wrong with that. You don't have to apologize mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. To Chris's point, like this is the okie doke, right? Right. We think there's something wrong with it. Everybody right. else is is acting expressly like like with it, within that box, but doesn't want to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's a, that's a really 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 good point. Um, last question. Like I said, I had all kinds of of crazy questions, but we'll, we'll wrap this up here. Um, Darrell, I want I want you to take this one first because I always talk about this when I'm talking to other people, when, you know, you're ever in the conversation. Is it about Napster. Who? No, no, it's about Napster. It's about your TED talk and, and, and how you, um, you know, correlated, you know, Napster and the, um, you know, the dramatic change, complete transformation of the, the you know, the music industry after that. Um, do you think, you know, moving forward, looking ahead a little bit, do you think that COVID could possibly be you know, a a Napster of some sort or a catalyst for the the uh, be responsible for the drastic change in in education. And I'm not just talking, you know, you know, education reform, school choice, you know, private. I just mean just as as a just general education in the United States. Do you think that COVID will be a catalyst for some drastic changes? Yeah. So, but so before I answer that, I just want to say that like. Um, you know, like, like tongue in cheek, we talked about this earlier. So, so I ostensibly had COVID, right, and had the antibodies. So I just want to say, like, I'm taking it seriously. And um, up here in my region of the country, the Northeast, you know, like it's it's been bad for a lot of people, right? So it's just important um, context that like a lot of people are 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 suffering, and like we need to do better, right? <laughs> like, like because because these people, you know, folks matter, like Black Lives Matter, like a lot of Black people are dying of COVID right now. It's a real serious thing. Um, that said, like your your question is really about like history and unexpected events that are traumatic, right? So, you know, 300 million years ago or something, the dinosaurs were walking around and they ran everything. And then there were these little things called mammals and they were hiding in places. And then a big rock fell out of the sky, hit the Yucatan, and now there are no more dinosaurs. Right. And in the Pleistocene of the late 90s. Right. <laughs> uh, 
You know, you used to have to go to this place where you got music on a little silver plastic circle. And then one day a college student figured out that you didn't have to do it that way. And now we don't do it that way anymore, right? Uh, and what uh, maybe the national thing's better, a, a better example of the, uh, uh, outside of the fact that something immediate and dramatic can happen and the world is different afterwards, because Napster is about habits, right? And how long mm -hmm. it takes to change the habits of a human being, right? Like big events happen and then sometimes people never go back, right? So mm -hmm. I know a lot of people are probably going to spend very differently now that they've been shut in for a long time than they did before, right? If you read any of the, like, um, I was reading something on Wall Street Journal today where, where retail outlets are like people's consumer habits have changed, period. Like they're not coming back, right? Because they've had long enough to develop new habits. We can't undo them. Um, and I think it is absolutely true that Americans will not engage with school in the way that they have in the past because of the disruption of the spring and now the fall. And I think that's for, for two quick reasons. One is that um, we as a, as a movement have been telling people that school districts largely are wildly dysfunctional and that it's most acute when it's black and brown people without a lot of money and without the ability to choose. And they've been saying, yeah, yeah, right. And now everybody's like, yo, y'all were right, right? Because <laughs> the scale of that dysfunction is, is seen at a level it's never been seen before. And so there are all these people that are like, what do you mean I can't send my kid back to school? Right in the richest town in Georgia, like you know, I'm paying for this. Like the you altered the deal, you know, and right. it's it's like a Vader Lando moment. <laughs> and I, I don't think that people are gonna forget that. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that for good and ill, um, people have, as a result of that, have taken back the onus of learning. Right? They they they've repossessed it in ways that have built this new activity, and it's pods and micro schools and like small groups of people getting tutors and and it's a it's a rise in homeschooling which was already one of the fastest segments african americans are already one of the fastest segments growth grow segments of homeschooling um and that i just don't think that can be put back in the in the box now now what now what the uh, what the the you know the big amorphous status quo will do teaching you is all this other stuff is try to regulate it out of existence in the near future um, so you can only pod if it's one of our people, right? Mm -hmm. You can only do it if it's in one of our buildings, right? We we are the cash vehicle, like the, like, and all of that stuff is, you know, it's the equivalent of being a hair, like regulating a hair braider, but for education, right? Um, and I think that's all out there. At the same time, like Nasser had changed the way people thought about music so much that you had to come to a decision that met people on those terms after that. And I think we might be in a place where that could happen here as well. Yeah, and, and one of the things that you mentioned also in that is that when you were buying CDs, I can't even remember if I have ever bought a CD. I was young, don't I was it. young, like my dad, my, I remember <laughs> them, my dad had tons, you know, I have a record player now. I have some. I have some old, <laughs> some old albums. But, um, but one thing that you all, that you mentioned in that in that talk, Darrell, is that like, you know, when you used to go and buy CDs, you would you would go and buy you know one or two songs, and then twelve or thirteen bad songs would just follow. Come along for and, free. And so yeah, and so and so now what what I'm seeing with whether it's you know pods or homeschooling or even or even private schools, you know, parents are now able to kind of personalize, right? Like like what they want. Like the public school might have had, you know, decent, decent test scores, but they were concerned about their child's safety, right? And so now parents have the the ability and the option to say, you know what, like I want a playlist, right? I want to make my own playlist. I want 12 songs from nine different albums, right? And so I think being able to do that is 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 way more important um, now yeah. than ever. And so, so can, I, can I talk on that? And and it's sort of a provocation for Chris as a recovering school board hmm. member. <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the, the thing that I think is really out there that nobody's talking about is that for the first time in like sort of an hour, you know, sort of time working on this, there's actually a real market for teachers. So right now you're a teacher, you get paid on a scale regardless of the result. Right, like if you are potting or doing these other things, you're only gonna get paid for the result. And so the price goes way up because the selection mm -hmm. goes way up, right? And so for me, I'm excited to see teachers 
excellent ones, truly interested, truly interested, truly capable, out in the world, paid what they're worth in a way that 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 radicalizes the whole thing. And and like I, nobody's talking about choice for teachers as a byproduct of more choice for families. But I think it lives right alongside that too. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 a really really interesting point. I'm adding that to my notes right now. Uh, Chris, Chris, any any comments on that as we wrap up? So you know, the music thing I think is a brilliant kind of analogy in the Napster thing. I love it, love it, love it as a person who's into music. So I'll tell you a quick story. Tenth grade, I actually um, cut school one day. I stole twelve dollars and quarters from my dad's bedroom. Went in his drawer. He had a drawer. Where he put all his change in it, and it was he had so much change in that drawer that I could actually literally steal twelve dollars in you know, order, you know, right? So uh, I cut school. I took a city bus to the plaza. This is in New Orleans, New Orleans East. Went to the plaza. Went to Sam Goody. It was either Sam Goody, or whatever the 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 southern equivalent of that was, and bought Prince's nineteen ninety nine album. Had been waiting for it to come out. And first of all, let me just say, Walter, um, I know what what uh, Darrell told you, but I had Prince albums that didn't have a single bad song on them. Rick James <laughs> albums that didn't have a single bad song on them. Michael Jackson albums that didn't have yeah, Culture yeah. Club, Townsend Twins. Let me just keep going on the list. No bad songs on Townsend Twins albums. Um, but anyways, um, I always say this to say, um, it was an event for me to go buy that album, but I was completely at the will of Warner Brothers on the day that they wanted to release it, how they wanted to release it. I had to physically go get it. There were a million artists that they weren't letting come to market that I would have loved and appreciate. Um, and the moment someone created the thing called the inter internet and musicians started figuring out how to use it to cut out the middleman and get me directly yeah. what I wanted to me personally, my world of music opened up. But my addition to this analogy is in education is um, you still have people who go into the streaming services and they look for their artists and they let the, the service create the playlist for them. They don't want to have to go pick the best Al Green song and then the best Lou Rawls song. Google it, millennials. Um, you know, all these different people. They don't want to have to do that. They just want someone else to do it. And in education, there are some of us that want all the options. An ability to go onto the internet and pull together some Khan Academy and maybe some K12.com uh, and a few other things in the Library of Congress. And then there are other people that just want something packaged and well done. Um, the school district is Warner Brothers times 10 right now. Districts want yeah. to make sure they keep the artist um, locked up and tell you when it's going to be delivered, how it's going to be delivered. The Napster moment is a policy moment where you create the system for others to to create what they want like chartering i think was one way of making that happen but what's the next chartering what comes right. after that and i think your question is is the one for right now is i don't know if COVID is going to be the catalyst because the empire the death star is pretty strong it's resilient it comes back after everything you know is this going to be our a katrina moment like three in the set, three in the uh, Said yeah. yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, like, right, like I, right. I, I, Walter, I would love to say to you, this is going to be the moment where the government has sent all the kids home and told parents you're on your own. And those parents are going to say, like, for the first time, like, really? I'm, it's wait, it's all me. It's all on me right now. And start if even 20 percent of them pull together some different thing for their kids or whatnot, that would be success. Yeah. Like if only 20 percent, 10, 15 percent of them do something radically different, that would be for me enough uh, to get uh, to, to cause some sort of, sort of progress. Anyways, I appreciate you having me on today, especially with this illustrative group that you have here. I am so supportive of you uh, and of the young people who are going to do things better than we did. I'm Gen X. We were the best generation, just so you know. We bridged between the boomers and between the Y folks, just so y'all know. We kept we kept the world sane for y'all. So y'all, you know, like we dealt with the boomers on one side. We yeah. set the world up Appreciate for Y. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Appreciate now it's about that. like now we, we we need to know what Y is gonna do for Z. That's what we need to know right now. Yeah. What is Y yeah. gonna do for Z uh in education specifically? So thank you for having me on. Of course, of course. And so Nanya, I'll give you I'll give you the last words here as we as we uh, bring this to a close. Anything you want, anything. I would just like to say thank you, Darrell and um, Chris. Yeah. Chris, I keep forgetting your name. Like I see, you, I see you, citizen. Uh, first name, his first name, citizen. Steve Breezy. Yeah, 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 I keep, I keep, I keep blinking like this. Sorry about that, but um, I would like to.
hear from, you know, people have, who have been in like this for a while now and um, just hear what you guys have to say and um, just hear all the knowledge that you ha- guys bring to the table and you see what you guys have done and just, just to expi- inspire me to, you know, keep it going forward. So I just like to say thank you to you guys and thank you for Walter too for um, setting it up. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Appreciate you, man. Well, Darrell, Nani, and Chris, thank you so much. I have so many unanswered questions on my on my sheet here, so we'll probably have to get together sometime soon and, and hash it out a little bit more. Let's do it. We'll do it. All right, appreciate it.